By the end of our last episode, God had kept the first two parts of his promise to Abraham. Israel was now a nation. But the Israelites were not in the land of promise. For 400 years, they had been stuck in Egypt. And it seemed like they would never live in the land of their ancestor, Abraham. But God used Moses to fulfill his promise and bring the Israelites out of Egypt to live in the land of promise. He also used Moses to show people how they could live to approach God's presence. Now there is only one part of the promise that remains. How will God use the Israelites to become a blessing to all nations. Join me as I discover the throne of David. My life has always been on the road. Ever since I was one week old, I've traveled the United States and the world. You could say I'm a modern day nomad. What I love about traveling is meeting new people, discovering new things, and getting to know more about the vast body of Christ that flows around the world. This trek will take us to the land of the Bible. I'm Stevie, and you're watching Stevie's Treks. Ah, I'm back, and I'm ready to find out what happened to the Israelites. So this site, Tel Jericho, is the place where the Israelites came after they had been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the site that they came first. God told the Israelites that Jericho, along with the rest of Canaan, would belong to them. So Jericho, right where I'm standing, is the first site of the Israelites' victory and reclaiming what God had promised to them. From Jericho, Israel spread out all over Canaan to many different looking places. From way up north in Dan, at the headwaters of the Jordan River, to way down south in Beersheba, Abraham's desert base. Each tribe settled its own land. Asher, Naphtali, Zebulun, Issachar, Judah, Simeon, Benjamin, Ephraim, Manasseh, which is divided by the Jordan River, and Reuben and Gad across the Jordanian border. And finally, Dan, which stopped trying to conquer land and settled here, way up north. Woo! Now that they were back in the land, God would use the Israelites to fulfill the fourth part of his promise. They would be used to bless all nations so that the whole world can live in the presence of God just like the Israelites could. But it would be a long time before that would happen. 
Now that the Israelites were in the land, I wanted to find out what happened next. So I decided to ask Cindy Parker to come along with us. She's an expert in biblical history and geography. Okay, so what's the main story of Shiloh? Well, you've been in the wilderness, right? Yeah. Okay, so you saw lots of tents, Bedouin, yeah. people out with their sheep and goats. A lot of sand. Lots of sand? Yeah. <laughs> and finding water is really difficult, so the Bedouin have to move all the time with their animals. Right. It's like the Israelites when they were in the wilderness, all that time moving. Okay. Then they cross the Jordan River, they're at Jericho, and then they come up here, and you can see this land is so different. It's hills and you can terrace these hills and there's lots of agriculture and there's water. There's actually grass. There's grass, there's greenery, it's really beautiful. <laughs> okay, so Shiloh, being surrounded by so many hills seems to be a protected spot. Do you think that you could hide something valuable here? Yeah, in fact, the Israelites put the tabernacle, their most valuable possession here. Okay, so talk to me a bit more about what the tabernacle actually is. When the Israelites were at Mount Sinai, God told Moses that he wanted Moses to build a tabernacle for him, which was a tent, and God could dwell in a tent, just as his people were dwelling in tents. And then as the Israelites wandered for 40 years in the wilderness, God could move and be with his people. So God's presence was among the Israelites while they were wandering in the wilderness. Yes, and then when they come into the land and they're up here settling down, uh, they bring the tabernacle here. To Shiloh. To Shiloh. So the tabernacle was here. Exactly. You think we could find it? Let's try. All right, let's go. Nothing. Hey, yeah. Well, you know, same at Shiloh. I'm waiting for Stevie. He's going to find the tabernacle. Yep, I know. Okay. All right. Cindy, did you find anything yet? Oh, uh, no. No, I haven't found anything yet. There's just a couple more here. Find a little something. Kickflip. Have you found anything yet, Cindy? No, I haven't. How about you? No. <laughs> well, did you find anything? No, I, I found some rocks. <laughs> uh, well, that's about what I expected. It was a tent, and so I'm not sure how many, how many remains we would actually find. Okay, all right, well then if it was a tent, I did find a spot that looks like you could have set up a tent there. Okay. You wanna go check that out? Yeah, let's do it. All right, let's go. Okay, so the spot I was telling you about, Cindy, is just stand up over here and I'll point it out to you. I was thinking down there. What do you think? Well, it makes a lot of sense because it's really flat and open. It makes for a really nice place if you're going to have a tabernacle or a tent set up in a very stable area. Okay. Um, the other possib possibility, though, is they could have brought the tabernacle up here because this is the highest point of the tell. Okay. And so if you're going to have something valuable like a tabernacle, people would have placed it up really high. Yeah. Could have been at the very highest point. So in one of these locations, we don't really know. So I kind of like either one could make sense. Right, exactly. Now about the tabernacle, what did it actually look like? We have some really nice descriptions of it in the Bible. Basically, there was a courtyard area, so an area that was blocked off from the whole rest of the camp, so that when you entered the courtyard, you knew you were in sacred place. Okay. And any of the Israelites could come into the courtyard. Inside the courtyard, there was another small tent, um, and that tent was divided into two different rooms. Okay. The first room you walk into was the holy place, okay. and then from there you walk into the Holy of Holies, and the Holy of Holies is where the Ark of the Covenant was kept, and the okay. Holy of Holies was thought of as like being the home, the place where God's spirit dwelt. I asked Cindy what happened next to the Israelites. She told me that even though they were back in the land, 
they had to wait a long time before God began to fulfill the next part of the promise. You see, for the next 400 years, the people of Israel trusted in gods other than the one true God. That was one of the first commandments, you shall have no other gods before me. Because of their disobedience, they were invaded over and over again. And even when God sent judges, warriors like Gideon, Deborah, or Samson to save them, they still went back to worshiping idols. Remember that God works through people when they are trusting in him. He would not fulfill the fourth part of the promise to the Israelites until they relied on him alone. Israel continued trying to conquer Canaan for 400 years, but they never ended up controlling all of it. They constantly had to fight off enemies attempting to take back the land. The biggest and baddest of these were the Philistines, Israel's arch enemy, and they were ready to attack. By now, Israel was ruled by a king, Saul. Saul gathered his army here on the western side of the Valley of Elah. The Bible tells us that King Saul had disobeyed God's instructions. God had found someone else to replace Saul as king. That person was David. David was a shepherd boy, and he grew up in Judah, in the town of Bethlehem. He was the youngest son of Jesse. He grew up in a time of war. His home was constantly under the threat of the Philistines. But God had a plan for David's life. He was about to change everything. There was a prophet named Samuel. He was the last judge of Israel. He helped the Israelites know what God wanted them to do, and God had told him to anoint a new king. When Samuel saw David, the Lord said to him, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed young David in the middle of his brothers. From that day forward, the Lord had a new anointed one. God's hand was clearly moving in David's life. David would someday be the king. But how would God take a shepherd boy and make him the ruler of all Israel? The Philistines had moved towards Bethlehem. The Israelites had to stop them at the Valley of Elah. David's brothers joined Saul to fight the Philistines. David was too young to fight, but one day when he was visiting the camp, he heard Goliath mocking the Lord. David was angry and challenged the giant. Okay. So here we are, Goliath, a nine-foot giant armed to the teeth against David, a shepherd boy with a sling. David wouldn't stand a chance, but David had fought a lion and a bear in the wilderness. He knew with the Lord's help, he could take Goliath. Okay, so here we are in the actual Ayla Valley. David and Goliath would have probably met in the middle, way off in the distance. This was an important battle. When Goliath saw a small shepherd boy coming to fight, 
He laughed at him. But David shouted confidently that God would win the battle for him so that all may know that God was in Israel. The giant charged, and David rushed to meet him. He stopped and quickly put a stone in his sling and swung. Goliath fell. David had hit him square in the forehead. God was in Israel, and David was a hero. Okay kids, last time we saw David, he had just defeated Goliath. And as you can imagine, he instantly became famous and he grew in his fame by fighting so many Philistines. But God had even more for him. God promised him to be a king of Israel. But remember, Israel already had a king, Saul. Saul and David were friends at first. But over time, Saul became jealous of David's popularity. He wanted David dead. David fled into the wilderness. Here at En Gedi, he hid among the valleys in this region. He ran from Saul for about seven years, going in and out of the wilderness. As he hid from Saul in the wilderness, he was always thirsty, always searching for water and a safe place to hide. It was here in the wilderness of Judah he penned these words. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water, so I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. David fled from Saul for many years. Danger was around every corner. He never seemed to have a moment's peace. How could he ever escape? Would he ever become king? His answer, came suddenly. Saul had died in battle. David with his small army took control of the southern tribes. He was finally king. God had kept his promise to David. Even though David was now king, he had a lot of work to do. He had to unite the tribes of Israel into one kingdom. He needed them to be like they had been in the wilderness with Moses, where God had begun to live among them in his tabernacle. The Israelites needed a reminder. Okay, one of, the, one of the festivals that God created for the Israelites from the Torah is called Sukkot, the festival of booths. I've asked my friends Gary and Cindy to help us celebrate it. So right now, well Gary, Gary, what are we doing right now? We are building a booth. We're building a booth. <laughs> That's what it yeah. looks like. They actually, uh, the Hebrew word for it is uh, a sukkah. And they, this is one, like you said, it's one of the feasts that, that the Lord commanded the Israelites to celebrate. And they do that once a year. And they build a booth. And, can you get that? I think I'm getting it. Okay. There we go. And uh, the family will 
for a whole week, leave the comforts of home, and they will uh, come and live in this booth. And it's supposed to be built in a way that reminds them of how they of how they lived yeah. in the in the wilderness during the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Right. That God looked after them, He provided for them, and He protected them. But they they lived in booths. They lived in tents. So it's kind of like camping out a little bit. It, it is. Yeah. And right. Kids kids love it. The only thing they they say that you have to be you have to have a leafy kind of a roof for sure. And you should be able to see like a star at night. But so when you we should look be up, good with this one. Yeah. So when you look up, and you have uh, either three or four, three walls with one open, or four walls with, with like an opening. So, we now have this wall. This is a natural wall. This one we made with our palm branches. We got another wall we yep. built here. Yep. So we're set. We got we're our set. booth done. We have our booth done. Awesome. Yeah. Now we have to set the table. Gary invited us to have lunch in the suka. As we ate, he told me how one of the important traditions with the holiday of Sukkot was hospitality. While the Israelites were in the wilderness, God had provided for them. He had given them food and water. Now the Israelites were told to remember God's provision and open their suka to all who would come. Get ready. The guests are about to arrive. Man, I didn't know I had so many friends. Okay, after David had been king for a while, he thought, I should build God a house. I'll build him a temple. After all, if the Israelites had moved out of their tents into homes, so should God. So David asked God. Strangely enough, God said no. David's son would be the one to build the temple, but God gave David an even greater blessing. Remember that the Israelites were not yet ready to fulfill the final part of God's promise to Abraham. Israel still had to be used as a blessing for the whole world. And here is when God made another promise. God promised that David's descendants would sit on the throne of Israel forever. God also promised that one of these descendants would bring the blessing to all the nations. God would fulfill the rest of Abraham's promise through David. David continued to unite Israel as a nation in following the Torah, the instructions of God. One of the first things David had done when he became king was to establish a new capital for his kingdom. He wanted a city that did not belong to any one of the tribes. Instead, he wanted a city located in a place where all the tribes could feel equal and at peace. This used to be a small Canaanite town, but King David came and conquered it and renamed it Jerusalem. King David would have built his palace up on this hill right here. And all the way up on this hill, his son Solomon would have built God's temple. Jerusalem would have grown into a larger city and was one of the most important sites of all Israel, known as the city of David. David continued to expand his kingdom, 
Solomon, David's son, expanded it even further. It seemed like very soon, one of David's descendants would be king of a nation large enough to bless the whole earth. They would be able to show the world how to live in God's presence. Okay, so here we are underneath the city of David, the ancient core of Jerusalem. Now, one of the things you've got to know about Jerusalem is it's built on a couple different hills. And at the base of these hills, on the outside of the city walls, is this water source, the Gihon Spring. You've also got to understand water is essential for survival. 300 years after David, King Hezekiah builds this tunnel from the city down to the spring. In case they were ever to get attacked, they still could get water. United States is only about 200 years old. This construction that I'm walking through is almost 3,000 years old. Try wrapping your head around that one. As I walked through the tunnel, it almost felt like I was walking back through time. Kids, can you imagine? Digging this thing out with a hammer and a chisel. With no electricity, maybe just a little oil lamp. Man, that would have been pretty scary. As I was walking through the tunnel, I began to wonder about the final part of Abraham's promise. If God was going to use a king in David's line, why was it taking so long? The Israelites had been in the land 400 years before David came, and now, 300 years after David, the promise was still unfulfilled. What happened? After David and Solomon, the kingdom had split into two, north and south, and neither of them were living according to the Torah. Just like in the time of the judges, the people had turned back to worshiping other gods, even kings. God would not use them to fulfill his promise until they listened to his voice. crazy how quiet it can get in here. All you can hear is the wind coming and going. You know, it makes me think how far away the Israelites went from listening to God's word, the Torah. Maybe if they would have just stopped and listened. God sent the Israelites prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, who told the people and the kings to stop their idolatry and to live in the way the Torah instructed them. The prophets were laughed at and sometimes even killed. As he had done in the time of the judges, God decided to punish his people because they would not follow his voice. He withdrew his presence from the temple and allowed both kingdoms to be destroyed. The land of Israel was invaded. The Israelites were killed or taken captive. David's descendants were no longer kings. In fact, most of them had been killed. How could God fulfill any of his promises now? Would Abraham's descendants never be used to bless the whole world?
Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you peace. Peace.